For years now, lost media has been a hot topic on the internet. Typically, people have their favorite pieces. Typically well-known pieces like Hidogata, Clockman, or Metropolis. Still, there are many more pieces that, while not as well-known, deserve not only equal time in the spotlight, but just as much chance to be found. These are those pieces. This is Lesser Known Lost Media. Welcome back to the channel, guys, and welcome to Volume 51 of Lesser Known Lost Media. I hope you liked the new intro. To those of you who entered our giveaway for the 50th episode, the winners of that will be announced on the Community tab later today. Also currently available to all of my YouTube channel members and Patreon patrons is the supercut of the Not Safe for Work uh, first 50 entries, so there is that if you were thinking about joining the channel. If this is your first time with the series, lucky you, you have 50 more videos to watch after this one. You could be at that all day. We've been doing this for a while now. But how it works is we start with four pieces of more obscure lost media that you just don't hear about on YouTube all that often. We usually take a quick ad break. We won't be doing that this time as I'm kind of doing it right now. And then we go into our fifth and final spicy piece of lost media. So without further ado, let's get going. At number one, we have Amadis de Gala, Lost Chapters of Chivalric Romance Books from the 14th Century. Amadis de Gala is a landmark medieval romance novel series from the Iberian Peninsula and the lead character of the said novel. In 1508, Spanish author Garci Rodriguez de Montalvo published the 1508 edition of the books, having claimed to have corrected and amended the original. The original version of Amadis de Gala may have been Portuguese in origin, consisted of parchment scrolls bound into leather covers, and may have dated as early as the 13th century. The three original unedited volumes of the Amadis saga are now lost, except for fragmentary remains in the Bancroft Library at the University of California, Berkeley. So yeah, a little bit of the history. Uh, Garcia Rodriguez de Montalvo uh, was in possession of three surviving volumes of the Amadis saga, which consists of parchment scrolls bound into leather covers, as we said before. He altered many violent chapters and altered the original ending, in which Amadis is slain by his son, Esplandian. Instead, the saga ends with a double wedding, in which both Amadis and his son marry their lady loves. This published version was enough of success of a success for Montalvo to write one final book in the saga. The story starts with a cross love story between King Perion of Gaul and Elsina of England. They end up having a child in secret named Amadis. After his birth, Amadis is abandoned by his parents and is raised by a knight named Gond Gondolas in Scotland. A wizard named Arcalius attempts to kill Amadis, but is protected by a priestess named Urganda La Descondia, who has gifted who has been gifted the ability of prophecy. That's a lot of weird foreign names I'm not good at. After overcoming the challenges in the enchanted Insola Finerme, including passing through the Ark of Faithful Lovers, Amadis is knighted. Oriana, a childhood friend and Amadis' love interest, chastises him over being knighted and grows jealous of a rival prince. This causes Amadis to descend into madness and go into isolation. Eventually, Amadis ends his isolation and overcomes his madness and helps Oriana's father, Lisuart, repel an attack on the kingdom. After a secret meeting, Oriana and Amadis have a child named Esplandian. Due to this, Oriana and Amadis must get married, but defer plans for 10 years. During this time, Amadis leaves Great Britain and travels throughout Europe, going as far as Constantinople, where he secures the favor of the child princess, Lenorina, who will become Esplandian's wife. On his way back, Amadis battles a giant Indriago, which is a monster born of incest. It is at this point that the original manuscript ends. Garcia Rodriguez de Montalvo ended up making a fourth book titled Esplandian and was followed up by other books by different authors. Throughout the ages, various continuations of the Amadis de Gala have been published in Spanish, French, German, and Italian. 
So what exactly did he change? Well, it is unknown what happened to the majority of the original manuscripts of Amadis de Gala, while a single fragment does remain and is housed at the Bancroft Library at the University of California, Berkeley, the rest of the manuscripts were likely destroyed at some point in time. As of the publishing of the article in the Lost Media Wiki, no more manuscripts have since emerged. I'm always a big fan of these pieces of lost media that are usually ancient pieces of literature because while were we to actually find them, it would be absolutely amazing. The fact that they are so old and that they were, you know, made of things like parchment or whatever and are likely have been destroyed either through age or through misfortune, it is likely we will never find them. But that just means that if we do, it makes the finding all the better. So, you know, that I actually is why I love pieces like this because while it is unlikely we will ever find them, uh, it would be the find of a century if we do in some cases. At number two we have Coolsville, lost build of a cancelled PC adventure game uh, from anywhere between 1994 and 1998. Coolsville is a cancelled jazz-themed PC adventure game aimed at a child audience. It was meant to be released in the fall of 1994, developed by Music Pen, and was to be distributed by Media Vision. The game is set in Coolsville, a city populated with anthropomorphic cartoon animals who are into jazz music. The city is divided into four districts, each with a different name and theme. There was Ragtime, Blues, Big Band, and Bebop. Coolsville is led by a council of six gurus who reunite each year for a public musical performance known as The Great Gig. This concert gives energy to the city for a year. But one of the gurus has been abducted, and the player character is set on a quest to find him, picking up musicians to form a band along the way. Now, several of the characters are parodies of famous jazz musicians and singers, such as Duck Ellington, based of course on Duke Ellington, and a talking yellow taxi cab called Calloway, a pun on Cab Calloway. The idea for the game originally came from Brian Giardi, the art director of the project. Though it is often presumed to be an adventure game, it is also very probable to be more of an interactive educational game, like, uh, you know, Pajama Sam or Freddy Fish because the Music Pen Company mostly developed educational games, most of them being uh, from the Magic School Bus license. The copyright trademark for the game was registered as multimedia computer software con containing information in the field of music. According to project manager Michael Dugan, it was an early attempt at a kind of virtual reality, sort of a animated history of soul music, and crossed over all other sorts of genres related to soul. Music Pen financed uh, the game themselves, and the art and animation was done by a large number of different artists and animators. The game was a pet project that had minor priority over mainstream titles, so development on it was erratic. Due to this, it is difficult to find specific information on what was being worked on. Unfortunately, Coolsville's release was cancelled after Media Vision was shut down. The only visual signs of, it ex of its existence that have ever been made public are a few screenshots as shown in several magazines that were published before the game was cancelled. These screenshots seem to imply that the game may also have had a music creating gameplay feature, such as a uh, classic, as well as being a classic point and click adventure. No prototype demo or concrete version of the game has ever surfaced to this day. Back during development, the game had previews in French video game magazines Joystick and Gen 4, which gave very positive feedback, strongly implying that they played at least a prototype. According to project manager Michael Dugan, he was under the impression that there was a prototype made sometime after he departed the company. The game was also reportedly introduced at the 1994 Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago. Now there is video footage and photographs of uh, this particular instance of Consumer Electronics Show that are still around, but there is no mention of Coolsville to be found anywhere in them. As a 90s kid, I remember when point-and-click adventures were like really big and uh, I mean my sister even has a full-on Freddy the Fish game, uh, I think that was from early 2000s, uh, but like the 90s, the early 2000s were big on these point-and-click adventure games. Uh, the thing about my sister's Freddy Fish game is it was actually given to her for getting a haircut at Great Clips, which I always thought was kind of funny, but the thing was is that 
there was an oversaturated market and especially if this was just a pet project also be the whole jazz theme i mean kids have never really been all that into jazz i feel like this one was put on the back burner and if there is still a demo it is probably a a very rough uh alpha uh so to speak i don't this just seems like it did was not given the focus that it maybe should have been in order to get out and on time and then of course when the company went belly up uh nobody picked it up but you know it sounds like a pretty cool idea and i'd love it if we could at least find that demo no matter how rough it might have been it, i think it would still be pretty cool one of the things I love about this series is being able to cover pieces of lost media from well-known properties that get overshadowed by more famous pieces from that same property. And to that end, we have Out to Lunch, partially found Sesame Street slash Electric Company crossover special from 1974. Now, if you're at all a fan of Lost Media and Sesame Street, you probably are well aware of things like Crackmaster, Snuffy's Parents Get Divorced, or The Wicked Witch Visits Sesame Street. But there was another piece of Lost Media that, until uh, researching this video, I'd never heard of. And that is Out to Lunch, which uh, aired as a primetime special on ABC on December 10th of 1974. It mixed the Sesame Street and the Electric Company casts along with guest stars Elliot Gould, Barbara Eden, and Carol Burnett. The production was jointly produced by Henson Associates, Children's Television Workshop, and ABC. The premise of the show was that the ABC newscasters had all gone out to lunch, and it was up to the Electric Company cast and the Muppets to make up an hour of programming. It has never been released on home video, and it is unknown if anyone has a copy of since uh, Out to Lunch came out shortly before the Betamax, which was the first commercially released home recording device, was released. And the U-Matic was very expensive, and consequently, it was extremely rare to find someone who owned a U-Matic recorder. An audio recording of the song We're in Charge has circulated, and some clips have been shown at a Sesame Street crew party. In addition, some clips were showcased on YouTube during its early days around 2005 to 2006, but this was before anyone knew how to download YouTube videos, and they have not resurfaced since then, aside from clips of two other Sesame Street slash Electric Company crossovers uh, irrelevant to Out to Lunch that still survive on YouTube today. On June 18th, 2019, Muppet Wiki co-founder Scarecrow, aka Scott Hansen, posted HD screenshots of the special on their Muppet Wiki page and said, special, and was subsequently reviewed by Tough Pig's co-owner Joe Hens a few days later. This shows that it was is likely still being maintained in ABC's archives, and while Hansen and Hens have this copy of the special, they cannot release it out of legal concerns and restrictions. On March 21st, 2020, Facebook user Robert Hudson Sharp uploaded a low-quality audio recording of the first 25 minutes of the special. Now, despite having no actual, you know, full copies of this, we do actually have uh, on the Lost Media Wiki a pretty good list of what shorts and sketches were included in this show. And if you'd like to find more out more about that, I do uh, recommend checking out the article on the Lost Media Wiki. But again, things like this, things that were a big deal, uh, you know, two very popular properties coming together to do a, a primetime special. The fact that it's never been released on video or that it's, you know, that just all this lost media that we know still exists, that still exists in archives and all that. And yet somehow uh, it's just not being released. It's like, what's the point? Like, oh, well, there's ABC, there's there's Children's Workshop, and there's Henson Associates, you know, that are all, you know, potentially have something on the copyright. It's like, well, either share the money or just donate it all to charity and release it to the public, you know? It's like, don't don't be greedy. Just let people see this stuff. It's always sad when lost media becomes lost due to uh, destruction. You know, it's it's like, oh, it, it sucks, but, uh, you know, what can you do? Nobody expected this to become destroyed. But it's worse when it's lost out of greed. At number four, we have a viewer-suggested piece from longtime viewer Blue Baron 6858 And that is I Dot and Jump, partially found English dubs of anime series from the mid-2000s. 
Aidat and Jump is a children's mountain biking anime that was broadcast in Japan on TV Tokyo from October 1st, 2005 to September 9th of 2006. The show is an adaptation of Toshihiro Fujiwara's manga series of the same name, which ran for 31 chapters in Kodansha's monthly comic Bomb Bomb anthology magazine between April of 2004 and October of 2006, produced by Trans Arts for Aniplex, the animated adaptation adaptation lasted 52 episodes. The anime has been dubbed into English twice, an edited version produced by Hasbro aired in Canada and the United States between 2006 and 2007, and a second uncut English dub was made for broadcast across Animax Asia beginning in 2009. Neither version was released on home video or on any current official streaming services. Unofficial recordings have been limit limited, leaving many episodes unavailable. Now, regarding the Hasbro version, an English version of of the show quietly debuted on Cartoon Network in the United States at 6 a.m. on December 7th of 2006. It was commissioned by American toy company Hasbro and was produced in-house at Cake Mix Studios, with recordings done at D-Spot in Los Angeles. The dub later began airing on YTV in Canada beginning January 9th of 2007. Cartoon Network's premiere run of the series ended on May 11th of 2007 after 26 episodes had aired. The show was removed from the channel's lineup shortly after. An additional 10 episodes reportedly aired in Canada, ending its run on October 6th of 2007. The show was then removed from YTV's schedule in December of 2007. It is not known if the 36 episodes represents the entirety of Hasbro's production or if additional episodes were left unaired. Various clips and full-length ep full episodes were available on Hasbro's Monkey Bar TV streaming site, which was shut down in 2009. This was the last time the dub was ever officially available. So basically, of these 36 episodes from the Hasbro dub, over uh, basically two thirds of them are still missing. As to the Animax Asia version, which was an uncut English dub of the same anime that began airing on Asia Animax Asia on December 12th of 2009, the, the dub was reportedly later aired on Nick India. Like many Animax dubs, the production was allegedly recorded in Hong Kong. There used to be 22 clips of the dub uploaded by media archive fan group ATTKC in 2017, but those links are no longer available, making the Animax dub at the moment completely lost. Now, this one is interesting to me for a couple reasons. One, it just seems like this is lost due to, at the time, it not being, you know, the American audiences weren't ready for an anime about mountain biking. At the time, anime was still kind of in its infancy in America. We were we were into our Pokemons, our Sailor Moons, our Dragon Ball Zs. There just wasn't a lot of room for something as mundane as we're going to be doing mountain biking. The other part that I find funny is that this Japanese show made for an English audience was sneakily, if you will, quietly released uh, early morning on December 7th of 2006, which there's a weird parallel to be made between another sneak attack made by the nation of Japan on American soil in the early morning of December 7th on 1941, a sneak attack that was, uh, to be honest, a lot more successful than this anime. Please don't cancel me. Am I canceled yet? No, it's been over 22.3 years, we should be fine. Hey guys, here's the part where I'd normally have an ad break where I try to sell you some stuff, but honestly, I just want to say thank you so much for staying with this series and for helping us get to through our first 50 episodes, and uh, here's to 50 more. So uh, without further ado, let's get to that fifth spicy piece of Lost Media. Today's spicy piece is The Fabulous Fanny, a lost Lee Frost sex comedy from 1975. The Fabulous Fanny, or its working title, The Coming of Seymour, is a 1975 sex comedy film that was directed by Lee Frost and produced by Wes Bishop. It starred Alan Spitz, Murphy Cross, Diane Summerfield, and Connie Marie. The film is a sequel to The Boob Tube, and the runtime of the film is 87 minutes. 
The plot of the film is as follows. A couple goes to an X-rated motel and becomes involved with the zany story they are watching on X-rated TV. It is about a voluptuous cartoon character named Fanny, who dominates the daydreams of young Seymour. It is this sexual obsession with a fictitious character that stands in the way of his siring a child that will enable him to inherit the family fortune. Seymour thoroughly enjoys his attempts to impregnate as many beautiful women as possible, but each time he is unable to reach that million dollar climax. Potency does not let him down, it just keeps him from his riches. Not until Terry, the girl next door, learns about his secret love is it possible for Seymour and the impossible dream to come together. The film was screened on December 18th of 1975 in Melbourne, Australia as The Coming of Seymour. It was also released in the United States by Constellation Films Inc. Uh, Independent International Pictures Inc. on February 9th, 1977. The film's recut version was screened on March 16, 1978 as The Boob Tube Strikes Again. The last screening of the film was on May 31st of 1982. In 1976, the film was banned in the United Kingdom by the British Board of Film Classification due to its explicit pornographic content. Now, as to its current availability, as of November 2008, the film is unavailable online. Due to this, it is unknown if The Fabulous Fanny was released on home video or not. No footage or trailer for the film has surfaced. However, film posters, stills, and radio spots are still available on the internet. Personally, there's just something about these old films that were, you know, known as sex comedies that literally were just made to have a ton of nudity, maybe a little bit of humor. That is, I, I just find the concept kind of funny. Like nowadays, you know, everybody talks about nudity in film as it's like, oh, hey, it's this big artistic thing. And, you know, there was a time when it was just like, look, we know you want to see some boobs. We're not going to make like a full on porno film, but we're going to, we're going to make a film where the whole point is to have a few jokes and show you as many boobs as possible. And I can honestly respect them for going, hey, this is what it is. And uh, this one just happens to have gone missing. I'm sure there's actually quite a few of these that came out and uh, nobody has access to them today. I know kind of they were kind of uh, the uh, they were the movie equivalent of the pulp novels of their time. And I'm sure a lot of them kind of came out and then quietly just ended up in some back room to degrade. Perhaps pointless, but interesting all the same. And thus it makes it onto this series. And that's the video, everybody. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, as of right now, the winners should have been announced on the community page. So please head on over there to see if you won one of the three prizes we were giving away for our 50th episode. Again, I want to welcome anybody who's new to the series to check out the previous videos. Uh, there definitely is a quality improvement over the past year as I learned how to better record on YouTube. I noticed that when I was making the supercut. And I also want to thank everybody who's been here uh, either since the start or came in somewhere in the middle for helping us, you know, uh, providing the views and the support to make it to 50 episodes. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to make the next 50 for you. So until next time, I'm Mr. Sean, this is Chimera Miniatures, and I sincerely hope that you alpha great day and an even beta tomorrow. Bye bye